Okay, good morning everyone, and welcome to this uh, event here at CNAS. I'm Richard Fontaine, the CEO of CNAS. We're really pleased to have the uh, privilege of hosting the launch of Dr. Peter Fever's book. It is Thanks for Your Service, The Causes and Consequences of Public Confidence in the U.S. Military. Um, as I was looking through the, the blurbs on the back, among other things, I was struck by this one by General Martin Dempsey, who of course was chairman of the Joint Chiefs. I'm going to take the privilege of reading this. No one, and I mean no one, knows more about the relationship among the military, our elected civilian officials, and the general populace than Peter Fever. An insightful, important, and timely work. Pretty good phrase. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so, uh, so Peter, as uh, we all uh, probably already know, is one of the foremost scholars of U.S. civil military relations. He's been a colleague to many of us in national security and academia and government. Um, he hasn't just studied the challenges of civ mil relations, but has actively participated in the process. Um, Dr. Fever, from 2005 to 2007, served as Special Advisor for Strategic Planning and Institutional Reform on the NSC staff at the White House. He had the responsibility for, among other things, the national security strategy, regional strategy reviews, and other political military issues. He was also Director for Defense Policy and Arms Control uh, at the White House. and has served, uh, again, among other things, as a member of the CNES Board of Advisors since its inception, and we're really pleased to have him. Uh, he's well known for his work on civil relations in academic outlets, military journals, more popular and policy-oriented uh, publications, and has focused on a variety of areas, including elite military cues, public opinion about the use of force, and in this, the causes and consequences of public confidence in the military, this data-rich uh, analysis of uh, public confidence in the military and what that means uh, for the kinds of issues uh, that I think all of us uh, think about uh, quite frequently. So uh, we're really pleased to have uh, Dr. Fever here. He'll be joined in conversation with uh, Kate Kuzminski, CNES's director of our Military Veterans and Society program, which focuses on civil uh, relations. Thanks to all of you for joining the discussion, and over to you, Kate, to kick it off with Dr. Fever, and congratulations on the book. Thrilled to have you here. I've said this on other panels. You're a walking, talking, <laughs> lit review of <laughs> civil relations. Um, any one of us in the room who's studied it at any point has either studied under you or has studied you, so we really appreciate the opportunity to launch your book in the world. Um, so a little bit about our program, we focus on military personnel policy, uh, veterans, military families, and civil military relations. And one of the things that we found is that on, the, on one hand, it's hard to fundraise around civil military relations, and on the other hand, it's impossible to escape civil military relations. From elite cues and the conversations between uniform leadership and civilian leadership, all the way down to how our population views military service and veterans. Um, so, as someone who studied a full range of civil military relations issues, what's the main question that you were looking at in this book? Well, before I answer that, I want to thank you for your kind comments. Thank you, Richard, for your exceedingly generous introduction. It, it really is uh, an honor for me to, and appropriate for me to present and launch this at CNAS because I can well remember talking to Michelle and Kurt 15 or so years ago when they said they were going to launch this, and I said, that's a dumb idea. <laughs> There's not a need for another think tank, and it's just not going to work. You, you, you have a good career. Why wreck it with CNAS? Well, of course. Fast forward to today, I was clearly wrong, and your only problem is how you reload with talent after getting raided every time by the administration. So clearly I was wrong. And that's actually how this book got started, because 25 years ago, <coughs> I led a project called the TIS Gap uh, with Dick Cohn on the TIS Gap, uh, studying the gap between the military and civilian society. And one piece of that was a, an analysis I did with Paul Gronke that looked at public confidence in the military. And I, we said, public confidence in the military is uncertain. It's brittle. And if you plot public confidence in the military over time and you put a pin where I, the, the when that got published, which was September 2001, you'll see that public confidence went up afterwards <laughs> and stayed high for the next 20 years or so. And so about five years ago, Jim Golby and I said, Let's 
dig into this question of public confidence and find out why I was so wrong 25 years ago. Uh, and that's what this, this project is. It, it's, it's extremely data rich, as you uh, or somebody s said. It's, uh, and all the data is available. It's right now on the Harvard Dataverse. You can download it, you can dig into it. The book, as ponderous as it is, just scratches the surface. Ironically, though, my bottom line is where it was 25 years ago. I, I think public confidence is high, but hollow. Public confidence is the social fact. It's one of the few things the public knows about the military, namely that the rest of the public seems to have high confidence in the military. That's still true today, even though it's gone down a little bit. Um, and I think that if you look at the drivers of public confidence, they're more likely to go down rather than up. But that's sort of how I came to, the, to study it and uh, where, where I ended up. Yeah, so you have good professorial roots, and so you came up with six alliterative categories of, of issues that you were digging into. So patriotism, performance, professional ethics, party, personal contact, and public pressure. Um, can you give us the wave tops of what those are and maybe what two of the most important ones were um, in your findings? So the patriotism refers to the war frame. Mm -hmm. And I do think that's one of the dominant ones. That is, right after I, uh, Paul Gronke and I published our piece, 9-11 happened. And that caused a rally around the flag. And then the military is highly salient, defending the country against an external threat. That creates uh, a boost in confidence. And, and that still is the long pole note, though that it's not clear now that the GWAT is over Will the public still say we're at war? Will they still think that way and sort of give the, the military the benefit of the doubt? The second long pole in the tent is performance. The Americans believe that their military is competent. Uh, and indeed, that has been demonstrated. It certainly is operationally competent and been demonstrated repeatedly. But again, is there a question, will the public say that the military is competent as they reflect more and more on, say, the outcome, the uncertain outcome of Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, and so there's reasons to worry about that. Those two are the long poles in the tent. Uh, the uh, professional competence refers to ethics. We, the public views the military as highly ethical uh, and tends to think that the, that the military is uh, honorable, not lying, et cetera. But, if you prime the public to think about scandals, ethical scandals involving the military, times when the military does not live up to their high standards, that actually drives down public support. Even just getting the military to, th I mean, getting the public to think about that problem, uh, that causes uh, public confidence to drop. So that's another one to, to watch. The partisan thing. We're a highly partisan country, as you know. Polarization really in affects everything, but it powerfully affects uh, civil military relations and public attitudes towards the military. And uh, if you say, what's the biggest change over the last two years? It's the drop in Republican confidence in the military. Democrat confidence remains roughly where it has been, and that's, it's relatively high. Republican confidence is still relatively high and appears to have stabilized, but it dropped since uh, 2020. We can go into that more if you want. Um, so that's the, the fourth P. Personal contact uh, is a, the, just the obvious. If you served in the military, you have higher confidence. If you have family members who served, you have higher confidence. Uh, of course, folks for whom, who can say yes to that are dwindling. Literally, they're passing from uh, the scene. As the World War II generation mostly passed, in increasingly the draft era generation is passing. Mm -hmm. So the number of Americans who have connection reducing, and that's likely to undermine confidence over time. And then the last one, which is one of the more interesting findings, I think, in the book is this idea of um, peer pressure or social desirability bias, the idea that people say they have confidence in the military because they think that's the correct answer to, to give. I, I, my favorite uh, page in the book is when I get to quote Larry David from <laughs> Curb Your Enthusiasm and the episode where there's a dinner party and a, a friend of theirs brings her date who serves in the military and they go around the, 
the room saying, thanks for your service, thanks for your service, thanks for your service. It comes to Larry David, of course, he just says, hey, how are you? And it creates this awkward social moment. He doesn't thank him for the service. And, and it, you know, the classic curb your enthusiasm. It goes downhill from there. He gets kicked out of, out of uh, the party. Uh, but it shows, uh, we, the, 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 when you use the tech survey techniques that are designed to catch social desirability bias, that is happening uh, in, in the public. And it, you know, what size it is, it's hard to say, similar to seven to even a quarter, fully a quarter of folks who say they have high confidence might be doing so as a result of social desirability bias. That is a real sign of hollowness because if the um, peer pressure argument, the politically correctness changes, and I would argue that happened during the 2020 campaign when some choices by President Trump and his uh, allies uh, to attack the military sort of created permission space to be uh, quote unquote anti-military or at least anti-general, uh, that creates a whole new social desirability bias moment. And so you could see uh, those numbers collapse uh, faster than people expect. And so that's sort of the, the wave top uh, version of, of the book. Yeah. Um, I will note for our online audience and for our audience here in the room, we will have questions towards the end. So for our online audience, I'll be paying attention to the questions rolling in if you want to start submitting them through the portal. Um, it, it brings up a question as well that um, I, I didn't prime you for, but I do think we've seen a change in the trend too of uh, who counts as the military mm -hmm. in public perceptions. Is it the generals or is it those who serve under them and that there's been a, a real discussion about the, the military is great, it's just the generals who are bad. Right. Did that come up at all? In yes, the so uh, in the survey we uh, asked this question mul multiple times about the military as an institution, about high ranking military leaders, about rank and file, about military people they know. And interestingly, you get a different result of, you know, as you think about military you know, what, well, what's your confidence in the abstract? And then think about p military you know, does it go up or go, go down? And so there's, there are interesting distinctions. Still, overall, no matter how you ask of it, the public has high confidence in the military, especially relative to other institutions. And that's still true today, even after the recent decline. But the other thing that you, your question points to is the public really doesn't know much about the military and doesn't draw the fine distinctions that the experts in the room that you and I, you know, we hang our hats on the difference between retired and active duty, between this service and that service, between guard, reserve, and active duty. These are distinctions that are lost on the general public. Uh, I think Colin Powell was the only one we asked about that the public could, with some reliability, indicate whether they were alive or dead. He, he was alive at the time and uh, active or retired, he was retired. But beyond that, when we asked about like the sitting chairman and things like that, public didn't know whether they were active or retired. That's one reason why, and this is a different question, but why I think the ethics that, go the professional ethics that govern the behavior of active duty need to extend even in retirement and moderate the behavior of retired. Yes, they are civilians, now and they've served honorably so they should have more freedom than they did while serving actively but the public doesn't draw that distinction at least the survey data suggests they don't yeah the uh, anecdote is that once you retire as a general your first name becomes general yes yes <laughs> um so thinking of these trends that we see over time there has been a change in recent years and we've seen this in polling in a number of organizations the reagan national defense forum put mm -hmm. out uh, survey research in the last couple of years your research definitely taps into it. So how have we seen this change over time? Okay, so a couple things are happening over time. One is uh, really uh, tracing the last uh, two years or the last year of the Trump administration into the, uh, the first two years of the Biden administration, a drop in Republican confidence. And you know, I think you can track it to mid-September 2020 when President Trump made the observation that he doesn't have confidence in the generals, including the generals that he picked and not, you know, and chose, but the rank and file, you know, loved him. Uh, and, you know, that was controversial on a number of dimensions, but 
from a public messaging point of view, that there's a very uh, influential elite voice that signals to uh, at least Republicans uh, a different message than they had been getting. And then, of course, that was amplified and really amplified by Tucker Carlson and others. And so I think that is driving uh, uh, some of the decline, which has stabilized, by the way, but some of the decline in Republican um, uh, uh, attitudes. This isn't my data. This is the Reagan data. But if you look at their poll, the mo last year's poll, they show pretty convincingly that when you ask partisans in the public and you prime them and you say, hey, public confidence has gone down. Tell me why. The re Republicans will give Fox News talking points. And Democrats will give Rachel Maddow, you know, MSNBC talking points. They'll trace the decline to the partisan talking points that they've seen. So I do think there's evidence that the polarized partisan um, debate about the military has seeped in at least with the most partisan of respondents. Two other things are going on. There's been a secular decline in confidence in institutions, all institutions. And so it's not unlikely, you know, as the tide recedes, for everybody, the tide's receding a little bit for the military. The military still is high relative to the other institutions that matter in this space, but um, everyone's gone down. And then the, the last thing I'll flag is there's a generational effect. Uh, so uh, the youngest generation really does not have the confidence in any institution that, that the uh, <coughs> more seasoned of folks like me, and I realize you're on the younger side of things, but th there's, there's really a stair step. And the youngest generation, so that's sort of the, the bow wave of the future, seems to have more skepticism about all our institutions to include the military. Yeah, we see that um, in the data even about college enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, so it, the military recruiting challenges are very specific, but I think they are symptomatic of a broader disengagement by you know, American youth between the ages of 18 and 24, all of whom are Gen Z, which is crazy to think that they're aged 10 to 28 right now. Yes. Um, so you, you touched on um, how public confidence in the military compares to other institutions. Um, but, um, and, and I think we see that both in the Reagan data, we saw it in, there was some good Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. trend analysis a couple months back that was looking at American engagement and patriotism and, and the values that matter over time. And I think the only one that was consistently rising was financial security. <laughs> mm. um, but a, a lot of the other, other indicators went down. Um, so you, you also looked very specifically at the um, indicators of public confidence by different demographics, mm -hmm. by partisan lines, by age, by gender, by race. Um, were there any surprising or confirmed trends that you saw? Yeah, so one interesting finding it, it relates to how Republicans and Democrats treat the military vis-a-vis -vis other institutions differently. So the pub high confidence in the military with Republicans co-varies with low confidence in other institutions. It's as if the mil Republicans see the military as the, play, the bastion they can you know, cling to while their confidence in other institutions is going down. For Democrats, it's the opposite. Folks who have high confidence in the military and are Democrats also have higher confidence in other institutions. So there's an interesting partisan sorting effect that's going on, and of course, Partisanship, you know, shows up in almost every uh, multivariate table in the in the in the book. Republicans uh, have much higher confidence in the military than do uh, the Democrats on average, um, and it, and their attitudes to other things in uh, about the military when you ask other questions vary in interesting parts and ways. It's also more a male thing than a female thing. The, it's more uh, white than an African-American, um, old rather than young. And so there's one uh, table in the book that sort of creates composite people, you know, suburban housewife from the Midwest or something, and racks and stacks them. And of course, the most, the highest confidence person would be a retired white male, you know, in his, uh, you know, high, uh, retirement age. Uh, they would have the highest confidence, and the lowest would be, say, a person of color, Gen Z, from San Francisco or something like that with no family, no connections to the military. 
and you can uh, follow the demographics uh, up the chain from there. Yeah, it's fascinating uh, to hear that. Um, so one of the things that's been very prevalent uh, in the media on both sides uh, has been the effects of recent trends in general officers um, uh, supporting political candidates, speaking on their behalf, and this is happening on both sides of the yeah. aisles. Um, so what has been the effect of that in uh, perceptions of military? Right, so this is campaigns endorsements. And um, Jim Golby and I did some work on that, you know, in 12, 2012 during the Romney versus Obama years, and then the, this, this data replicates that uh, for 2020. And the finding is, is pretty robust. That is, the public does not move in great uh, direction uh, from a, a military queue. So l hearing that the military endorse or retired military endorse this or that presidential candidate doesn't move the needle very much. Um, but uh, you can move it a little bit more in a surprising direction. So if a military endorsing a Democrat, that would be surprising. Uh, given you know tradition of Republican uh, connection to the military, so that in 2012 had a slightly larger effect. Likewise, uh, in uh, in 2020, but these are very small and on the margins. Here's the problem: it may be just large enough that in a close election, when candidates are doing everything they possibly can, it may be uh, large enough that they're willing to do it. And I. That's unfortunate because I think it's, it's a very pernicious effect. It politicizes the military precisely because, as I said earlier, the public isn't drawing this distinction. So when John Allen walked out on the stage in 2016, actually they marched out, you know, just in case anyone didn't get the <laughs> message, the, and they all stood there at attention behind him, that was saying, hey, the military, if they could speak, they'd vote for uh, Senator Clinton. Well, of course, Republicans did the exact same, but it was Mike Flynn and other military saying, oh, no, 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 if the military could speak, they vote for Trump. This politicizes the military, and, and the institution that has dropped the most since I started in this in business is the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. which used to be you know, held in high esteem and uh, is now uh, held lower. Uh, and I think it in p large part because it is uh, viewed as a partisan institution now rather than as something above politics. We need the public to view the military as it is, which is a nonpartisan institution that will serve whoever is elected under our Constitution. And, and it, when we drag the military in, we civilians drag the military into partisan efforts, we're... Uh, we're playing fast and loose with that. We're chipping a, a away at it. But it's worse than I just said, because one of the other things that the poll shows very depressingly is that the public does not hold the military accountable for this norm that I just described. What I just described is what you know, professional civ mill you know, nerds like me have been saying. But in fact, the public defines politicization slightly differently. Mm -hmm. For them, politicization means when the military aligns with the other party. So for Democrats, they see the military as politicized when they embrace Republican, when the military embraces Republican policies or talking points. And Republicans see the military as politicized when they embrace policies that Democrats support. But when the military is embracing their side, they say that's okay. So the public is not, you know, policing this norm, mm -hmm. um, and that allow, that gives the military space to be uh, to misbehave, and and I think over time it's going to hurt. Um, but it's uh, but we can't count necessarily on an, a quick reaction from the public to rap the knuckles. Can I just add one yep, more please. point on this? Um, I think it's time for a new norm in this space. And so I'm, I've got this Don Quixote effort to create a norm that uh, is a new arms control regime. It's an arms control regime that says, let's give the uniformed military 
non-combatant immunity in the culture wars. So let's say, let's make the military not valid targets in the culture wars. There are legitimate debates to be had about uh, providing health care funding for service women uh, post jobs. That's a legitimate policy debate, principled positions on both sides. The civilian policymakers should be having that debate and should not target the military, shouldn't hold the military hostage uh, to change the policy. That would be making them a combatant in the culture war. Uh, so th I think if we started to promulgate this norm, enforce this norm, we could re uh, re you know, rebuild the idea that the military should be outside of partisan politics. It requires, though, change of behavior on all sides. It requires, right now, given the distribution of the executive branch, Republicans to resist the temptation to target the military when they're criticizing, you know, diversity uh, policies or something. Target civilians, but not uh, the military. It requires the Biden civilians to stand up and take responsibility for defending their policies rather than hiding behind the military. Don't push the military out to defend the policy. Civilians need to defend the policy. And then, of course, it requires the military not to act like combatants. So the military has to defend the values of the institution, but not in a way that makes it seem like they're culture warriors. So everybody has to change slightly. But if they do, I think we can build this norm that says the military should not be combatants in the culture war. So that's my little yeah. soapbox. And uh, you have a, a great idea that you've brought up on a couple other panels this spring as we've been talking about the ABF at 50. Of, you know, there isn't an incentive with the general public, but there are incentives within the political party to say, I'm endorsing this person. Uh, so I, I liked your idea of the full page ad of mm. retired general officers who will not endorse anyone. Right. Well, that's not mine. That's Zachary <laughs> Griffith's idea. It's a great one. Um, the, uh, if you look at the people who do not endorse, that list is long, lustrous, and much more impressive than the list of the few who do endorse in presidential campaigns. Um, and so uh, it is the case that most senior retired general and flag officers recognize that engaging in the political combat, uh, particularly of campaigns or of culture wars, is not good for the military. Uh, but enough do. <laughs> that uh, from the public's viewpoint, it seems like the military is a, a partisan uh, actor and, and, or that's, and that's problematic, I think, in the long run. Yeah. So getting to the so what, there's two, party, uh, two players in this. There is the military and uniform leadership specifically, and then there are civilians. So let's get to the so what for the uniform side. What are the practical um, consequences or um, challenges that perceptions and a decline in the perception of military service, how does that affect them? So the high confidence in the military is mostly good for the military. It's something that the military tracks. I have not had a conversation with the military about civil that goes longer than five minutes in which they don't say, hey, you know we are the most respected institution. So that's a, that's a number they track, and, and they're right to do so. It, it is important. It's not an unalloyed good, however, and perhaps I should have flagged this earlier. One of the phenomena that, that I think sh shows up in the data is uh, what I call pedestalization, where we put the military on a pedestal. Uh, and uh, if you put somebody on the pedestal, that means they're looking down on you right from the pedestal. And, and you, if you're a military officer, you could feel that way. Uh, and uh, I think some of the awkwardness about thanks for your service in airports, you know, that's the, where I got the title, uh, is, a, is, you know, that, that dynamic of putting someone so far on their pedestal. But of course, as we know from the movie White Christmas, it's dangerous to be put up there because <laughs> you could be knocked down. The, uh, th the military could be tempted to think that they're better than civilian society, and then Thankfully, there's not much evidence of this yet in the polling data, but the military, the civilians could start to look for um, 
military solutions to cultural problems for which there is not a, a military solution, and that would be an inappropriate thing. That would be militarism if, if we got there. I don't think we're there yet, but that's something to watch. So the military, I think, should focus instead on deservedness, right? Be professionally competent. Be meet your high standards of ethics, because the public thinks you are, and so if you don't, then it's a mm -hmm. shock when you don't. Um, stay out of partisan politics. Deserve the high level of competence. That's the, that's the message for the military. For civilians, it's, it's slightly different. The effect of high confidence in the military uh, uh, does have a lot of good. And so I think I am not rooting for a decline in public confidence. People with higher confidence in the military are more likely to recommend others serving in the military. And so if public confidence drops, that's going to weaken the, uh, the voices or di dilute the voices, reduce the voices of those encouraging young people to serve in the military. We have a recruiting crisis. It's driven largely not by partisan issues, but by the labor market and a couple other things, which you know better than I do. Uh, but nevertheless, on the margins, it's not helpful <laughs> for uh, partisan voices to say, don't go into the military because it's this way or that way. So uh, high confidence is important for recruiting. It's also um, connected to support for defense spending. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm going to reveal my uh, partisan colors here. I think we need to boost defense spending. I think we, uh, we, given the geopolitical environment that we're in, we need a very strong and robust defense. Well, attacking the military, undermining public confidence in the military, likely will reduce the public's willingness to spend on defense spending that I think we need. Uh, and then public confidence is associated with sort of willingness to use the military and see the military as a usable, uh, re you know, reliable tool. And uh, I think that's also important. And so it's important for um, civilians uh, to have high confidence. It's important for the military to earn confidence. Can I make, I know I'm, Please, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm a terrible uh, answer of questions. I'm a long-winded <laughs> answer of questions, I'm sorry. Um, I, am, I don't want public confidence in the military to go down. I do want public confidence in civilian institutions to go up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the policy prescriptions in the book, which makes me seem really like Don Quixote, uh, is to have the military, uh, when they are thanked for their service in the airport or wherever, to say thank you, that's very kind of you, and then ask, so what do you do? And if the respondent says, well, I'm just a school teacher in middle school, oh my goodness, thanks for your service. Have the military thank the civilians for the kinds of other ways you can contribute to the public good beyond military service. I don't want it to make it seem like there's only one patriotic way to serve that's in uniform and all other ways are lower. There's many, many ways. Of course, we desperately need to restock on an annual basis, folks willing to serve in the military. That's very noble service, good, but there are other ways to serve. And I think the military can actually be a voice acknowledging these other ways of serving. And I think in the long run, that will be good for the military's relationship with civilian society, but also good for the country. Yeah. So with that, I want to open it up to questions in the, in the room and also online. So if you're online, please do submit your questions. We'll be tracking them here. Um, anyone in the room? Tom. Yes, thank you. Uh, oh, we've got remarks. a mic coming. Thank you for your remarks. Really uh, uh, interesting. Should this matter of dropping public confidence in the military be, should the executive branch, should Congress be concerned about that and should they in fact be acting to try and bolster confidence in the military? Should it be an active form of public policy to reverse these trends? Thank you. Well, first, thank you for your service, <laughs> sir. Uh, but, and thank you for that question. Yes, but not to the exclusion of their other responsibilities. So, right, the, the civ Congress, for instance, they have an oversight role, and part of their job is to hold the military's feet to the fire. So if there's a program that's, you know, has cost overruns, that's not working, or there's a policy that's heading in the wrong direction, I don't want the Congress to do happy talk 
Uh, I want them to be uh, grilling the executive branch to include the military if that's the, the appropriate place, and you know, pushing for better policies. In a similar way, uh, the executive branch has to be the, one, the lead for setting our foreign policy and, and uh, managing you know, the, the, raise, uh, sorry, the um, operations of the military. And that requires tough scrutiny. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a zealot on civilian control of the military. Uh, and thankfully, we have a professional military that recognizes that and that further recognizes that they will obey lawful orders even if they think those orders are wrong. So civilians have a right to be wrong. They have a right to change direction on a policy that turns out to be misguided. And we want the military to advise before left of decision and then implement right of decision. So there is a role for that. But here, more directly in answer to your question, I think civilians are mostly to blame for the politicization of the military. I think the military can up its performance in this area a little bit, but the civilians can up their game a lot. And so I think uh, part of the problem is that the military spends time thinking about civil-military relations and then does a lot of civil-mil. Civilians do a lot of civ mill, but don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. And so I, I'm all for uh, education campaigns that, that try to get executive branch officials and members of Congress to think about civil military relations and the sort of second and third order consequences of how they conduct policy fights. That's where I would put my attention. And I would add to that um, PME, professional military education, you tackle this at every echelon along the way. There's no real equivalent of that on the civilian side. Perhaps there should be um, a lot of individuals who work on the civilian side, the first time they experience something like that is, you know, if they get selected at year 16 to go to a war college and interact with, with their right. military counterparts, but that's really late in the game. Can I do, give a plug here to CNAS? Um, so <laughs> for, for years and years and years, Dick Cohn and I have, have taught a variety of civil w workshops for the military in PME settings. And we always ended that uh, with the mic drop that said, we've talked to thousands of military officers, never to civilian political appointees. And in 2016, Michelle Flournoy and I said, we've got to, you know, we've got to change that. It's a great end line, but we want to <laughs> We don't ruin want it anymore. <laughs> And so we developed a, 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 a training module that was aimed for um, civilian political appointees. And it took us a while, but General uh, Secretary Mattis did have that for his top 100 political appointees once. Uh, and that was uh, I, uh, an interesting moment. I had some very senior, uh, very, very senior civilian DOD leaders say, man, this is the first time I've thought about civil military relations and civilian control. I thought, oh boy, okay, because uh, you are very senior. <laughs> uh, but um, that was one does, once it done. And then uh, in 2021, we were able to do it again for a, a range of political appointees across state, DOD, and the White House. And I, I, I think that's good, but you're right. It, it, it's regularized for the military, and that was more of a one-off on the civilian side. We need to do more. And congressional staff and members of Congress even harder to reach. They're just super busy and uh, you know, finding time for them to talk about this topic, which is kind of esoteric, uh, is hard. That's why those who have great connections, C CNAS, Heritage, others, have a solemn responsibility to realize that their conversation they have might be the only time mm -hmm. that staffer has thought about Civ Mill. So, Make sure you're getting it right. Yeah, I've thought about that even with some of the lines of questioning that we saw during the posture hearings and whatnot. Appropriate questions for a service secretary are not necessarily appropriate questions for the service chief. Mm -hmm. um, and increasing the knowledge among staffs and even members of Congress on who, who you ask the policy questions to and who you don't, um, I think is important. Let me give a plug to, yeah, this yeah. is not my book, but this is something else. There's an open letter from last September, mm -hmm. September of, uh, 2022 signed by all the retired secretaries of defense but one and all the retired chairman of 
Joint Chiefs of Staff but one, that lays out sort of best practices in American civ mill and civilian control. I think that's a great resource. I hope everybody on the Hill reads that. I hope that letter becomes a standard APQ mm -hmm. for anyone getting confirmed to a DOD position, civilian or military. What do you think about that letter? Do you agree? If you disagree, where do you disagree? That would be, that would elevate the conversation and the debate about uh, civ mill. So I flag that yeah. for anyone to consider. I'm going to flip to an audience question. So this question is from Judd, who served on the uh, National Commission for Military, Public, and National Service, um, asking, uh, what lessons from your findings would you commend for improving public perception of the broader national security community? So mm -hmm. there's there's limited understanding of how the military works. It's even more limited on yes. how these interact. So clearly, uh, one of the uh, more quixotic recommendations in the book is we got to improve civics education in the country. And you know, I get excellent students at Duke. I'm, I, I'm proud to serve them. But I can tell that they're arriving with limited uh, you know, store of knowledge on a military and diplomatic history, things that we in this room might take for granted as common knowledge. They're just, it's not common knowledge for the, you know, the rising generations. And so um, across the board, uh, just America's experience in the world. How did it go for us? Uh, they are used to high defense spending. Well, is, there's nothing more American than under defending, underfunding defense. That's been our historical <laughs> tradition is to underfund defense and then catch up, but at a huge price in blood mm -hmm. when we discover that we've been underfunding. So these are kinds of historical lessons that uh, the American people don't know. So we gotta do a better job of uh, civics education, I, I think. Um, now, in terms of the, his service on the national service, let me, let me be clear. I support national service broadly defined, and I think that, that finding ways for everyone to contribute to the public good to include an expectation that, that you're going to do a gap year of some sort, everybody. I've had many students who would have benefited from a gap year. <laughs> Everybody uh, to do a gap year where they're serving the country in some way. I'm not in favor of a return to the draft. The all-volunteer force is an institution that has served the country better than the draft military did uh, and is better suited to our current geopolitical environment and the changed character of war that we operate on. So I'm a fan of salvaging the all-volunteer force. There's a new book coming out in uh, next year that's going to be talking about this. And I support all aspects of that book that talk about fixing and saving the AVF. And I'm just skeptical about returning to the draft. I think the draft is a cure that's worse than the disease if your concern is connecting the public to the country. I think there are other ways to do that. Yeah. Um, to the audience, uh, Debbie. Um, thanks for your remarks. Um, I had two quest two part questions, sorry. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you see as the family's role in shaping some of the public perceptions about mm -hmm. the military. And then the second part is how do you see a program like joining forces, which you know is connected to a, a single administration that hasn't really been institutionalized. How do you see a program like that um, also shaping these perceptions, but could it be elevated um, to continue past a single administration? Right. So the um, families, you know, personal connections to the military do drive attitudes towards the military. Personal connections meaning you either are friends with the military or more likely you have family members serving now. And so uh, as every recruiter knows, uh, it's not an individual who joins, it's a family who joins or you might recruit the individual, you retain the family. And so uh, the military is a family business. I'm worried that the military has become a family business in another way, though. That is that the only highly propensed uh, joiners are children of uh, uh, current serving members. Um, I don't want their propensity to go down. In fact, it has gone down. There's some evidence it's dropped a little bit. I don't want it to go down, but that, if that's the only one, if, if, if we're only recruiting 
the children of our services, then we're becoming into a tribal caste system. And I don't think over time the all-volunteer force can thrive as the demographics of America change. So we've got to get out of that you know, spiral, uh, but we have to recognize that we have to retain the family. I mean, ironically, um, the, the, if you'll permit me to make a partisan observation or an observation about a very sensitive partisan issue, I think Senator Tuberville's holds are hurting 300 general flag officers, but are really hurting hundreds and thousands of family members who are you know, connected to that, and not just the ones who can't get nom confirmed, but then all of the ones underneath in the replacements. And so the, the impact on the, I, I think General Brown put it this way, the spouses network, you know, the spouses network is starting to say, hey, do you really want to stay for the, ex the next five years if, if we're going to be in this kind of partisan environment where your chances of making 07 or whatever are blocked for reasons that you don't have any control over? It's being done to you. Uh, then the spouses start to turn against retention. <laughs> Uh, then we have a real, real big problem. So families, you, re, you got to retain families. We've got to have policies that keep families together. I mean, and, and, and have families drawing meaningfully from uh, what services. Now, as you point out, you know, our system changes hands and we're likely, I'm quite sure that the White House will change hands in my lifetime. Uh, again, several times. Hopefully I live long enough to, many times, probably. Okay, so we have to, carve part of, uh, policies that have a bipartisan foundation that won't get turned on and then turned off with each um, uh, uh, new administration. There have always been partisan debates about this or that weapon system. You know, I'm old enough to remember debates about the MX and things, but there tended to be a bipartisan consensus on the importance of high caliber human capital in the military, well, the kinds of soft, you know, not weapon systems, but human capital stuff that I'm talking about, that we've been talking about. And I, I hope we can get back to that kind of um, policy uh, situation where there's more bipartisan consensus uh, to keep uh, retaining, uh, sorry, recruiting and retaining, drawing from all walks of life, uh, and then making sure they are, stay in the military and are mission focused. Andrew? Oh, no, anyway, I can talk. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Cooper. Uh, I wanted to react quickly to something you said earlier uh, in response to a question, which was talking about how the civilian leaders should not push the military out to become the very mm -hmm. thing called they should. I'm wondering how that's problematized by having appointees like Secretary Austin appointed as a for him. question though is, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about the differences between uh, this period and the post-Vietnam period in the composition of the military, how it differs and how it's similar, obviously, a transition to the United States Air Force today. What kind of challenges those different kinds of similarities present as we're trying to prepare for this kind of composition of the country? Right. Two great questions. The first the, the first one, I, I full-throatedly endorse Secretary Mattis. and. Um, I do think that, that, uh, that Secretary Mattis's nomination was similar to the last time, the time before that, that they did the nomination of a retired four-star that required a, you know, a, a quote-unquote waiver. That was Secretary Marshall. S President Truman had lost confidence uh, with the public in the DOD national security space at the Korean War. He was in political trouble and needed you know, a strong, hand, reassuring hand at DOD. Uh, and that's why he picked Marshall, and that was appropriate for uh, Truman. And I think we were in a similar situation with a new president, President Trump, that had not really prepared for the commander-in-chief role like previous candidates. And so Secretary Mattis was a reassuring voice. Four years later, though, we're in a different situation. And President Biden had access to the entire Democratic bench. I mean, everybody was willing to serve in the Biden administration, uh, and everybody was eligible to serve. And so uh, it was a slightly different situation. And I don't think the White House ex was ready for the pushback that they did get, not just from Republicans, but 
crucially from their own party. Uh, a sec the way Secretary Mattis handled, uh, sorry, Austin handled it was the correct way. He made a point of saying, I'm gonna have a very strong civilian OSD, civilian team. I'm sensitive to this issue uh, of being a four-star general who's supposed to embody civilian control 24-7. And so I, I suspect it will be a while before we get another um, four-star uh, retiree recent as Secretary of Defense. But of course, since I have such a bad record of prediction, <laughs> uh, you could bet the other way and make money. Um, your other question was, oh yes. I, the, the longitudinal data is not as rich because it really starts, Gallup starts in the post-Vietnam uh, uh, era. That's when we get the best data. But uh, what, you, what you see was that the, public, that the military wasn't held in quite as high esteem uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Vietnam War, and perhaps understandably so. The military was, by its own uh, leaders, described as hollow. And we had race riots it's within the barracks. We had genuine problems in the military at the, in the wake of, of Vietnam. And it really wasn't until you got um, the Reagan buildup that uh, restored s sort of the legit the confidence of the military, vindicated, of course, by the performance in Desert Storm. I want to avoid going back to those sort of post-Vietnam era uh, of a hollow force or a you know deeply partisan divided force. One thing that changed uh, was uh, Democrats, particularly post 9/11, um, became less hostile to the military. And so you do see, uh, while there's still a partisan gap, uh, Democrats more uh, confidence in the military post 9/11 than uh, than before. And that. Um, you know, that hasn't dropped yet, in part because we have, you know, democratic administrations. So when the party, when the branches flip, how will Democrat votes go? That's something, or not votes, but how will their attitudes go? That'll be something to track. All right. Uh, Jonathan? Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Fever, uh, getting back to the issue of congressional politics in the military, you mentioned Senator Tuberville's hold. I'm, I'm curious a little bit about any observations you might have about the behavior and rhetoric more generally uh, of veterans who serve in Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find that they're a bit more uh, aware and respectful uh, of concerns about politi politicization of the military, or do you find that their rhetoric generally aligns with their caucuses, um, or are they perhaps more forward-leaning and more damaging uh, all of the above. So I can find anecdotal examples of every single one. I do think it's important for veterans to serve, and I probably should have said this before. When I talk about military in campaigns, what's problematic is not military running for, I mean retired, veterans running for uh, office. At that point, they become partisans, and um, that's, that's fine. If the only thing you got going for you is you served in the military, you're likely not to do well as an elected official. Everyone thinks of themselves as another General Washington, another General Eisenhower. Those two were very gifted political individuals. They were very gifted politically and also served as generals, and that's why they were great presidents. So just because you made it to general rank doesn't mean that you have the stuff to be a good politician. It is a different skill set. So running for office is good. It does not make you necessarily a cheerleader for the military. Ask the Air Force what it felt like <laughs> to be on the receiving end of Senator McCain, who served you know, honorably with great distinction and then made it his business to hold the Air Force's feet to the fire. So just because you serve doesn't make you a shill for the, the military. Um, there's a separate and a special category that is growing in number that I think deserves more study. I have not studied it, but there's great scholars out there who, who are starting to look at it. And, and I, if I had a young person, I'd tell them, take this issue. Folks who are senator Monday through Friday and then become lieutenant colonel on the weekend, um, that's an interesting uh, dual case uh, 
you know, I served in the reserves and I was a you know, lowly director for defense policy and arms control at the Clinton NSC from Monday to Friday. Then I was an even more lowly, you know, probably lieutenant at that time uh, in the Navy reserves. Uh, I, but I was more high ranking in the civilian than as a, a military, but everyone in the military knew that I was also had this White House job. So uh, it's a interesting dual role and I, I I think there's lots of opportunities for um, contamination <laughs> across those two lines where the professional ethics of one or the other get in the way. Of course, there's opportunities for fertile cross-pollinization and of ideas, so I think it could net, net positive, but there's lots of room for mischief. And so I think folks who have that and are serving now have to be especially careful, um, uh, and particularly when they're running for office, the way they use, say, their uniform or, or whatever. So uh, I know uh, Dr. Heidi Urban has written on this, and there's other great uh, younger scholars working on this. Um, more needs to be done. All right, we have time for one more question, so I'll turn it to Heidi. You mentioned the Gallup poll um, a, a minute ago, and I'm curious if you have thoughts and observations on the most recent poll that came out at the beginning of the month um, that showed the partisan gap might be narrowing a little bit, but mm -hmm. still Republicans edge Democrats in confidence in the military in to the tune of 68 to 61. What do you take from that? Um, is, is that are we overhyping the impact of the anti-woke attacks on the military and how that might affect public confidence? Yeah, I, I think that there is that Republican connection to the military took decades to form and it's not going to go away with one tweet or truth, you know, from uh, a presidential candidate or even multiple ones. Um, I do think that uh, that the partisan talking points are resonating, but when then you press to say, okay, give me actual tangible examples of this or that problem. Uh, then it reduces to a very tiny uh, number of anecdotes. Uh, you know, th I've heard my Republican friends say that, boy, the Biden administration is obsessed with right-wing extremism. And then you say, oh, well, golly, tell me, give me the example for that. Well, there was the stand down in, what, March, April, 2021. Uh, okay, yeah, but that was two years ago. <laughs> what, you know, where's the witch hunt since then? There hasn't been so much of a witch hunt. So I think, some of the facts uh, don't necessarily support the more extreme critiques from the far left or from the far right. And over time, then, I think truth will out. I do think, though, that the wings of both parties, so if you go to the far right, so the neo-isolationist wing of the Republican Party or the far wing of the Democratic Party, um, there's big debates brewing within the parties about the role of the military, the role of military power in Ameri American military power in the, in the globe. Uh, and those debates haven't been resolved and maybe they'll surface and get resolved in the 2024 election, I don't know. What happens there will, will echo through uh, public attitudes to the military. But I'll, I'll probably end here with this, this point about that confidence number. As I said before, it's one of the few things the public seems to know with accuracy, <laughs> namely that the public does hold the military in high esteem. Uh, and so what we don't know is what is America like, I mean, in our professional lives, what is America like if that's not true? Uh, historically, over the 240 year history or so, what, while we don't have polling data, we do know that the public had high affect for the citizen soldier that went into Vietnam, uh, sorry, to the Civil War, World War II. They got lauded, but the professional military was held in low esteem. Uh, and that was fine when we didn't need the military. But what about today when we face a pacing challenge from China? We face real threats around the globe, and so we need a strong military. Can we afford to go back to the old American way of disregarding our military? I think that would be too dangerous. And so that's why I hope that the public learns about the military, hope the m military earns high 
uh, public confidence and the public gives it, and that's what I uh, hope the book contributes to. Yeah, and I think there's a number of folks in the room and online who carry that responsibility um, with the weight that it, it requires as well. So I think it's on us as well. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Fever, for joining us. Um, for those of you online and those of you in the room, uh, the book is out for sale. So And the data is available. And uh, the data is available, uh, which is great. Um, so thank you all for joining us, and thank you to Dr. Fever. Thank you. Thank you. you did a great job.